Hey, welcome to another episode of Footnotes. Today we're talking to Colin Griffin, the founder and CEO of Crumware. Colin's gonna talk to us about not just what it's like to start a company and to grow a company, but what it's also like to grow the people inside of the company, which is something I think we don't talk about often enough. Check this out. For this episode, we're, we're, we've got Colin Griffin, who is the CEO and founder of Crumware uh, here in Columbia, uh, which is a, um, I think I'm gonna get this right, a, a technology company that uses technology to help companies basically get better at whatever they're doing. That's what you're doing for your for your customers. Um, you know, Colin, we've known each other for a while and we've, we've talked a lot about business and the challenges of business, you know, like finding customers and marketing and, and things like that, that I think just cut across all businesses, but you guys have had some some challenges that have been very particular to Crumware, to sort of how you work, even what you're working on. Um, why don't we start there and you kind of catch us up on the journey that you've had from maybe when you started to kind of where you are along those lines of sort of solving some of those challenges. Sure. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Sure. This is awesome. This is a cool setup. <laughs> we, um, Chromeware has been an interesting journey. Uh, so at the very beginning, it really just simply started as a wayfinding journey for me. Um, we were in an interesting place at the company I was working with previously, it had just gotten acquired. Um, culture was still great, still loved the work, still loved the people, but the future kind of became uncertain. Hmm. And so what I needed to do was kind of take a step back and have my quarter life crisis, I guess. Um, and just, I needed to take a chance on myself and just see if I could go and do something on my own and test my mettle is, is really what that ended up being. So I had made a commitment to myself. I said, if, if I'm still here a year from now, um, no matter what my financial situation is, whatever that looks like, I just need to go out and give it a shot. I've got a couple ideas. Maybe I can make one of them work. Who knows? We'll see. And so when that time came around, I honored that commitment, um, took a leap of faith, had about $5,000 in the bank, decided I could probably have about a three month runway. And at the end of the day, I could either maybe go back to where I was or just go get another job. Mm, okay. Maybe that wasn't too big of a risk. Um, and when I started the journey, um, so I, I had to think of a name and Chrome was just always something that was in my mind. So we added where to it because we're building technology and it just makes more sense to people. So it was easier to tell people what we do. And that's a whole other challenge to unpack even today. Um, but we had initially started out, I had started out with a couple of ideas to build products. Uh, I wanted to build an app, and a really great idea. Would still love to build it someday. Um, still kind of tiptoe around it and want to get there. Um, but I got beat to market. Within three months of starting, I got beat to market and by another company in Colombia. I had no idea they existed, but uh, it was just a funny situation. And I had to use that as a chance to step back and realize, like, again, remind myself, there's really no such thing as a unique idea. There's no such thing as a unique problem. Um, let me see what I've built. Let me take a step back and, and just reflect on, on this experience that I went through. And it really forced me to think about the idea that uh, I built a lot of really difficult and hard things. I learned a lot of great new technologies. It took me into a whole new technical stack. Um, I started investigating and having to learn all kinds of new things. And it really took me to a different place. And it was fun along the way. Um, but the big problem was, you know, when you start a business, you've got to make money. Right. So if you put well, you don't have to, but it, it makes it better if you. Yeah, it makes it better if you. If eat. you can eat, then you tend to do better. Sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that became that, along with those challenges, became kind of an inflection point there, and, and part of my wayfinding. Right. So I had to figure out. Okay. Um, I put. I invested all of my time and energy into this. Did I do anything here that was salvageable? And. The reality was all of those skills and expertise and everything that I had gained was very marketable. Um, it was things that other technology companies were looking to leverage and do and move into. And I built all that expertise while I was trying to build this product. And I, I had to take a step back and reflect on that because if we can find a way, if I could find a way to help other companies build their ideas and build their things using those technologies, then that makes a whole lot of sense. Then I start to kind of 
de-risk and diversify a little bit, and I have a chance to help other people build great products. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to own 100% of a product. I just want to build great things. I want to build cool stuff. And so... What, what is it about building that you love? It's always doing something new, and it's always having to, to learn and always having a challenge. I don't want to, you know, walk on a treadmill for the rest of my life. I'm very much that kind of person. You know, I'd rather go just pick a direction and go jog and run and go find a path and go explore rather than you know, go to an anytime fitness and stand on a treadmill and stay in one place or maybe watch TV. Um, for, for me, for my professional journey, just for my life, I thrive on challenges. I'm a back against the wall kind of person. That's when I get my best work done. And so I was starting to figure out and find a way I mean, that was honestly why I jumped out and tried to do this thing on my own, was trying to create this extreme kind of challenge for myself. Um, but now I was starting to understand and find a way that I can continuously have challenges and still maybe make a living off of that. So you, you started your company. It sounds like you were employee number one, and you were employee number one for a while. But fast forward a bit till you, you had people that, that were working in the company alongside of you, you were building things. What happened then? So one of the first things um, that happened, uh, we I stumbled across our, our first services client, we stumbled across at a barbecue. Um, the things that they were trying to build were really in my wheelhouse. They aligned well with what I had done in the past and I knew I could help them, it was a natural fit. So um, as soon as I got started with them, day zero, uh, I went out and hired interns, day zero. Not as a um, a way to boost my uh, billable numbers or anything like that, but more because I knew in order to scale, in order to scale myself or in order to do more things or have the time to focus on the things that I needed to, I needed to start building that base, that talent base from day one. Uh, the later that I'd wait to get started on that, I'm, I'm not, I'm, how would you say, I'm not going to be able to serve as many people with just myself mm -hmm. than as if I could start to grow this thing and start to help train people and mold people and help them, you know, give them opportunities to do great things as well and grow into themselves. I, I was very deliberate about doing that. Um, so, you know, first time we had a check that was on the way, it was, I need to go find smart people and give them a chance. Mm -hmm and make sure that I give them the right chance. So you mentioned hiring interns. Where where did you find interns? Oh, right down the road, South Carolina. Okay. Yep, so I sent an email to some of the professors, just mentioned some of the things that we were doing and said, okay, here's the type of work that I need somebody to fill. And I got about 20 resumes the first day that I put that listing wow, out. okay. Um, and that was really interesting to me because I'm a no-name, right? Hmm. Nobody heard of my company before. I don't have a reputation yet. Mm -hmm. Yet these students were looking for interesting work. And I, I really think it, it came down to um, showing them in that job posting, in those listings, that there was interesting work to be done and it was gonna be hard. And I think that resonated with people. How did you style that posting to, to make it seem to, to the reader, if you will, that the work was interesting? I just wanted to bridge the gaps a little bit. I came through the program, so okay. I'm, a com I'm a computer engineering major mm -hmm. uh, from University of South Carolina. and. I knew the types of things that I was trained, and I knew the types of things that I wish I had learned, right, that I wish I had gotten <laughs> exposed to. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped me market, probably unintentionally to a degree, but I think that helped me market to what the students might, that were like me would have been interested in. So I mentioned several new technologies, I mentioned things that I knew they weren't teaching, and I made sure to say that these are the things that you're going to be using, but you don't necessarily have to know them today. So, I mean, if I can kind of paraphrase, I mean, it, does, it sounds like you were lo looking for curious problem solvers. Yeah. The hackers, builders, makers. Um, the thing that we really look for the most today are the assemblers. So it's, <laughs> it's the people that can pull parts and pieces of things together and really make something creative and functional out of those. So when I when I hear when I hear you talking, you know, of course you would say you know your business is you're you're making things, you know you're you're making technology for for people to use in their in their in their work. But I get the sense that Crumware, you're also sort of uh, you're 
um, you're making people. In other words, you, you're or you're equipping people. I mean, you said something earlier about, you know, when you're hiring people and you're, you're training them and you're sort of teaching them and giving them real problems to solve. I mean, what does that look like? And, and how have you seen that aspect of, you've got to make a product to ship, but at the same time, you, you've got to have the people that are equipped to do those things to make a product to ship. What's that been like for you? So I think as part of the unique journey of having to figure out what it means to build a company, right? coming into this and not having any prior company building experience. I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I'm not interested in the buy-sell journey. Um, I just truly, again, want to build something great. Building a company, to me, is like the ultimate software problem. Right? It's <laughs> okay. like, I literally, we're trying to code and trying to work with these unpredictable pieces and engineering for failure. And there is no undo button. There's no save as, right? There's no reset, uh, none of that. Uh, and so I very much took that, that mindset going into it. Now it sounds like I'm really deliberate and have all the answers, but most of the time our technology journey and our knowledge journey is very unknown, right? We have this fog of war, this blank space that we know there's something in there that we need to grab, but we don't really know what that is or how to get there quite yet. And uh, the first thing that I did in as a training tool, as as really as a growth tool, was to make sure that we set up the right kind of environment culturally, internally, to, to allow people to take chances and to, um, to fail, but with safety, like with a fallback. And we found that we can leverage these, these little projects or these, um, these technology building projects as a facilitator or a way to get traction, both on the knowledge side, on the idea side and the creativity side. Uh, but mostly to give somebody something to focus on to, to progress them, mm -hmm. right? That is their road. That's their, I talk a lot about that as traction and not in the book, the traction sense, but you know, how do you give somebody something that allows them to, to actually progress and move forward? And you gotta give them something to do and you have to, to let them know that they have the responsibility and the authority to make some decisions and take some risks and go for it. And that's the best thing that I can do. When, when you're thinking about people and their own learning and how they can apply that learning to a, a workplace setting, you know, it, it just seems natural that, that there are some things that have happened that have been good and some things that have happened that, that, have, that you've learned from. Um, what are some of those learnings? And again, I, I get that you're still in this, like it's still running in real time. Right. Um, and, and the book hasn't been written, so to speak. but. What have you learned as a, as a founder and as, and as a chief executive um, and as a professional? I mean, we'll take us through some of those learnings um, that, that can probably, someone else out there needs to hear that and needs to know that they're not alone in some of the things that they're learning as well. Usually, like classically in IT and IT services, which I didn't realize how transactional this market is <laughs> uh, from and when I say transactional, it almost feels, it's its almost too black and white, I guess. Um, somebody will come to you with an idea that they have and say, how much is it gonna cost to build this thing? Mm -hmm. And then all they care about is the financial side and the transactional side. They're thinking, how much money can I save over time? Can I eliminate some personnel this way? How do I gain efficiency, right? A lot of people are really, really, really transactional about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality today is there's a lot of companies and a lot of businesses that are having challenges or problems because they have a product that they use or something that they've built and they stick it over in the corner and act like it's this thing that's just supposed to print them money. Right? It's not a first-class citizen in the business. And in reality, in order to build a successful product, it's just as much building a successful company. The infrastructure and the code is only about half of the rest of the things that need to go into building that product and sustaining that product. There's systems and there's people and there's knowledge, right? There's a lot of other parts and pieces around that. And I think companies lose sight of that idea. They just think, I have this perceived need and I need some code to go fill this hole and then see you later is that's kind of when we came into this. And so what are you trying to change about that? What are you trying to tra change about that transactional nature that, that you're seeing in, in the work that's coming into you? So 
The nature of the way we work is changing. You know, the pandemic was great, if anything, because it highlighted to companies that they should probably care a little bit more about their people. Mm. And if we take a step back from that and we just take a look at what people really do care about, you know, there's a lot of people that just want to be told what to do and, and follow a guideline and, you know, punch in and get their work done and punch out. And that's mm -hmm. great. But there's also a huge amount of people that want to contribute back to the business and want to be given new challenges and want to try and do different things. And the folks like me that may have been wayfinding a little bit or weren't sure if they wanted to stay in that job long term. And so technology is just the low hanging fruit for us. That's a big, hairy, scary thing that a lot of people can start to build skills for on their own and start to transition into. And it's very attainable, right? It's very reachable. And if we target that and leverage technology as an excuse to help people build themselves, then in turn, you're giving your people an opportunity to really transform your business along with you. So on one hand, can we give them the tools necessary for them to thrive in their workplace? Um, but can we also give them the skills and the environment that allows them to grow with those tools or enhance those tools or find and adopt new things and just fundamentally change the way that they work so they can truly do the stuff that they care about? So aside from, I'm, I'm sure, you know, for someone to come in to work at, at Crumb, there's technical skills that they've got to have. That's kind of a do not pass go type thing. But it sounds like some of the skills that you're talking about that, that are being developed by people that are on your team. I mean, what, what are those additional skills on, that, that sort of sit on top of or maybe even around the technical skills? You know, what, what's, what's a well-equipped Crumb teammate? Like, what are they bringing in or what are they gaining as, as they do their work with you guys? Sure. I think the biggest thing that we look for, um, we, we have a, a thing that we say, we want to get you from zero to contributor in 90 days. Okay. We want to make sure that you are a team member that is supporting others and is actively trying to do more and is finding finding holes and fixing things, right? Somebody that is actively working toward making the team better. That's what we define as a contributor. And if we find those people that um, can display resiliency, that um, aren't resistant to change, right? That can uh, find success in seemingly unsuccessful things, if that makes sense. The, the ones that just because they got something wrong, they don't shut down. They say, okay, how can I do this a different way? You know, I think that's the most important thing, but the thing that we have to help build into people is the idea that uh, we trust you and it's okay for you to do these things. In fact, it's expected of you to, to find your path this way and to work on things this way. And I think that's the most important thing that we have to train into people because we're being taught that there's a certain way to do things no matter where we are, right? Mm -hmm. We come, we say, you're gonna, you're gonna have a four year college degree in engineering and you're gonna go find a great salary job and they're gonna give you all the tools that you need. And the reality of that is it's not true. And frankly, small businesses and medium sized businesses, the places that can be the most interesting to work, don't have the tools necessary to train you that way, mm. right? So. How can we enable our big challenges? How can we enable businesses like those to create the right environment so that they can hire those folks that would be successful if they don't necessarily have the resources to train those? That's a big challenge that we are trying to solve. Just one of the challenges. But I think those, we talk a lot about soft skills and I, I think just having resiliency is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest thing to train into people sometimes because I think they're taught to expect otherwise. Yeah, there's a lot of talk of that word these days and, and even sort of the definitions of that word. But I, I think I understand what, what you're saying in that um, it, it's probably a, a mix of um, maybe curiosity and tenacity. You know, if you try to break that down even further, you know, what makes someone resilient, you know, um, and, and how do you become resilient? And I think, you know, what, what we're learning is that it's, it's really probably how you respond to negative experiences um, which, which are harder to deal with, you know, emotionally, sometimes physically, things like that. Um, and, and having that, that combination, and there's probably other words that there are other ingredients in resilience besides curiosity and tenacity. But I mean, those are just the ones that, that, 
kind of come to mind. And um, it, it's not unlike, and maybe that's one of the footnotes here is that, you know, um, it, it's the things that will make you resilient um, might stink at the time, but when you string those together in overtime, um, it, it can help make you a great contributor at somewhere like Crumb or a lot of other businesses that are that are solving problems. Because I think that's part of the nature of problem solving is that you're probably, it, it's a problem because it hasn't been gotten right. And so in the process of trying to solve that problem, you're probably gonna go through several incorrect or, or unresponsive iterations on something before you get there, you know, and, and I think um, maybe we emphasize the speed of getting there too much as opposed to the process right. of getting there. And I think that's what I'm what I'm hearing you say and what I think is gonna be helpful to a lot of people that watch this is that um, progress is more of a process. Um, it's not necessarily a, a finite destination, but, but we've been lulled into this sense that um, progress is instant, progress is, is um, often or, or, or happens at a, at a high frequency. And I think uh, for someone like yourself, like you said, when you're on this journey, um, you get it on occasion. And when you do, it's really great. And then you kind of settle back into normalcy. <laughs> um, what would you say just kind of as, as a parting, uh, you know, word? I mean, what, what would you say to, to someone who is, is a founder like yourself um, leading a company, even if it's just a company of one right now, what would you say to someone that might be in that middle zone where, you know, they haven't found that success yet, they're maybe beyond an initial problem, but they're still going, what would you say to them? Man, hire us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's a tough one. I think everybody's I think everybody's answer is going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what's that's, your answer? Right, but that's the hard part, right? Um, I think my answer would be just trust in yourself and, and trust in your people. Uh, we all reach those points where we kind of second guess ourselves. And um, when I talk to people a lot about the, the biggest times that we had challenges or struggles, the biggest challenges that we had I can almost always tie those back to a time that we took our foot off the gas, hmm. that we didn't trust ourselves and we didn't keep doing what we believed in or keep trying to press forward in our path. And I think that's the, the mantra that I'm sticking to now, uh, especially through the pandemic, is I have to be willing to crash and burn. Right? We have to be willing to take risks on ourselves. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And we'll just find out a lot sooner. And then mm. that'll let us change, right? That'll let us adapt again. Um, but I'd just say, trust yourself and don't step, don't take your foot off the gas. Well, I love what you said about, we'll find out sooner, you know? Um, while that may, that may be scary, I think sometimes knowledge is what we're looking for. Uh, you might not like the way you find it, but you know, I think that is, I like the way you put that. Hey, thanks for sitting down with us and thanks for just being willing to share and being transparent about what's going on just with you, but also with, with your company and uh, wish y'all all the best. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks.